All right, now Hebrews chapter 12, the part of the chapter I'm going to be focusing on here is when he's talking about chastening from the Lord. And the title of my sermon this morning is Despise Not the Chastening of the Lord. And um, if you look at, look at Hebrews 12, look at verse number 2. We're going to start right up in this, in this first verse. We're going to jump back here in the second verse. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, one of the main purposes for the sermon this morning is so that you don't get wearied. So you don't faint. There's a lot of things that happen in the Christian life. There's a lot of battles. There's a lot of struggles. And there's also going to come with that chastening. Okay, now, there, and, and we got all these different things to deal with. Sometimes, you know, it could be attributed to yourself and to your own, and to your own sin. And that's what we're going to be dealing with this morning. But other times, it's just persecution for being a Christian. Other times, it has nothing to do with your sins. But either way, you've got a lot of things, you know, coming in as an attack on you, which can discourage you, which can bring you down, which can get you out of the fight, which can get you out of church, which can get, get you out of serving God. And what, he's, what he starts off here with Hebrews 12 is saying, look, First, you need to consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Think about Jesus Christ and what he went through. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He was perfect. Jesus Christ was without sin. He did not deserve any punishment that he received. Yet he allowed all of that to happen. Yet everything that happened to him, you know, he allowed it. He despised the shame. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. People spit in his face. They put a bag over his head. They smacked him. They did, you know, they, they put their crown of thorns on his head, mocking him like, oh, you're some king, right? They did all these things, and then they, they hung him up on the cross. And the Bible says, cursed is everyone that, you know, hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ was, was cursed in man's eyes. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And this is how they treated him. So, the first thing I want to point out is no matter what you're going through, whether it's for, from your own cause or not, don't be wearied and don't faint in your mind. Think about what Jesus did for you and what he went through. And, when you, and we were just talking about this yesterday. I was talking with Dwayne um, at, at his house yesterday. You know, when um, you think about people like Job, you think about people like Jesus Christ who go through a tremendous amount of troubles and trials and afflictions and persecutions and you compare that to yourself all of a sudden your problems don't seem so big anymore they don't seem like they're they're you know the whole world's going to end because of whatever may be going on in your life and this is what he's trying to get us to, to understand as we go through these different problems that we don't get wearied we don't faint because the worst thing that you could do in your christian life is to quit is to just faint, just to get out and just stop serving Christ. Now, we're going to have hills. We're going to have valleys. We're going we're to have high points in our Christian lives and low points. But you have to keep moving forward. You have to just stay with it. And um, keep that in mind as we go through this sermon. Because we're gonna be, I'm going to be preaching through about the chastening of the Lord. And chastening, it says, it's not pleasant for the moment. When, when you get punished, when God has to, has to deal with you as a father does with a son because you're, you're in error, because you're doing something wrong, that's not pleasant. And if you are a son, you will go through this. And we're going to see that from Scripture. But let's look at verse number 4. He says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. He's like, you haven't gone there yet. You haven't done what Jesus has done, so don't faint. Verse number 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So again, he's, he's mentioning don't faint, you know. He said, first, don't despise it. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Don't be mad at God when things come, you know, aren't going your way, when things are going wrong for you. Don't start getting angry at God, and especially if it's chastening. Because chastening comes as a result of your own sin. That's why the chastening comes. That's not a mistake. It's not just Satan attacking you. That's something that you've done wrong that God needs to correct you for. Now, we don't always know for sure when we're being chastened or when we're being attacked. But this is why you have to just analyze yourself and, and take a look at yourself whenever you are going through hard times. Sometimes it might just be Satan. But don't just automatically chalk it up to Satan. Take a strong look at yourself and think, hey, 
is this possibly coming from anything that I'm doing? Because Satan doesn't visibly just come and say, you're not going to see him coming. Be like, oh wait, Satan's coming. I'm going to get my shield out now. You have to, it, it, you know, these are, this is a spiritual battle. We're not going to see that. We have to have our, our, our spiritual armor on. We have to be founded in the word of God. Yes. But when things, bad things happen to us, just always take a, take a look at yourself. And what, what can I be doing different? Is God disciplining me? Am I being stiff-necked about something? Am I not being receptive to it? Am I just getting into sin? And normally you should know this. You should already know this. It should be something that, that, that you know, the Holy Spirit is going to be convicting you about, that, that you've seen in the Bible, especially more importantly. I mean, you know, a lot of people might say, like, oh, well, the Holy Spirit didn't convict me about that. Yeah, but if it says it in the Bible, that's, that's the truth. And, and, you know, we need to make sure that we're living holy and righteous lives to the best of our ability. Obviously, we're still sinners, but that doesn't just give you an excuse to just go off and run into sin either. We need to be trying our best to, to be living up to the way that, that God has for us. And because it says here, you know, God's a father, the Bible says in verse number six, he says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, that word scourgeth is an old word, but that to scourge, that basically just means to whip, right? So the Bible saying that God, if you're getting chastened by God, if you're being disciplined by God, that means he loves you. So you're gonna, it may not feel like that at the time, but try to keep that in your memory. Like, hey, I'm going through all this stuff, man. I sinned. I did all this other. But if God's dealing with you in a certain way like that, that means he loves you. Look at how God dealt with King David. When King David commit the horrible sin of adultery and then added on top of that the sin of murder. I mean, this isn't just some small thing. He transgressed very serious. He has very grievous sins against God. And God brought a severe punishment against him. That child died that, 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 he, that um, Bathsheba was impregnated with as a result of David's sin. But that's not where it ended. David had all kinds of problems within his household like ever since that. You think of Absalom. You think of Amnon. Amnon's the one who, who raped Tamar, his, his, his half-sister. And um, you know all of these different family problems. He had Absalom re rebelled against David and, and tried to take over the kingdom. All of these things, you know, a lot, of, a lot of punishment came as a result of David's sin. But we see that God still loved him, and God didn't remove completely his mercy from him, from him either because he, he was a child of God. David was saved. He was born again. He was a believer in God, and God didn't completely remove his mercy just like any fathers or any parents today that have children understand, you know, Sometimes your children do things that they need to be chased and they need to be disciplined for. And, and depending on what they do, the discipline might be more severe than, than other infractions. But no matter what, you don't completely remove your mercy or loving kindness from them. I mean, there's the, the, the discipline has to end at some point. You're not going to just, just keep doing that forever. But um, you do that because you love them. And, and the same thing, you know, the child may not understand. it be like, why are you spanking me? You know, you know, this hurts. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> but it's because of love. It's not because you hate them. It's not because you just want to inflict pain on them. It's because you want them to grow up right. And that's how God deals with us as a child. Look at verse number seven. He says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? He's saying, you know, if you're getting chastened by God, that's how, that's how a father deals with their son. And he's saying, what son is he whom the father doesn't chasten? Who the father doesn't discipline? Now, I want to get into this a little bit. Turn, if you would, keep your finger in Hebrews 12. We're going to be keep going back to Hebrews 12. We're going to be using Hebrews 12 as our guideline going through the chastening of God. But I want to flip over to Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. So if you have your bulletin or something, stick that in Hebrews 12. We're going to be coming back there. When we're talking about God disciplining us, us, disciplining us, excuse me, it's important to understand that, hey, it's the same way that we ought to be disciplining our children. And this is something in the world's view, in, in, our, in our modern day and age, the forms of discipline have changed. 
that this world has come up with, with new ways of, of how parents ought to be raising their kids and ought to be rearing them up. And I'll tell you what, the Bible hasn't changed. The Bible's the same. The words of God don't change. It has been the same forever. God's word is from everlasting and to everlasting. I don't care what the newest study says. I don't care what some psychologist says. I don't care what any, anyone in the world has to say about how I ought to be raising my children. I care about what God has to say about raising my children. And we're going to get some words of wisdom from the books of Proverbs because Proverbs tells us exactly how we ought to be disciplining our children. Look at verse, or chapter number 3, verse number 11. The Bible says, first of all, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. This looks very familiar. It's from Hebrews 12. Um, Neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. So he's saying, look, if you're getting corrected, if you're being disciplined, that means God loves you. Flip over to chapter 13, Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13. I'll read from you while you're going there. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So the Bible's saying, look, you need to discipline thy son while there's hope. What, what that means while there's hope, it means while they're young. Because once your child grows up, when your child's like out of the house, when they become, if you haven't been disciplining them, if you haven't been chasing them, if you haven't been, been you know, properly disciplining them while they're young, it's not going to work when they get older. Once they get, get old enough, it's too late. You, you have your chance while it's early. You have, to, you have to do it while they're young in order to change their behavior. It's just like, um, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? You have to, you have to teach a dog their, their behavior when they're young because once they get older, I mean, you can't try teaching a grown-up dog that jumps up and everything else. Try to teach that dog to sit and behave. It's, it's, really, really, really difficult. You have to start when they're young. But it's the same way with, with children. Now, obviously, your children aren't animals, but um, hopefully not, at least. I mean, so <laughs> some kids may act that way, but, but hopefully they're not animals. And, um, but it's the same concept. We need to start with their young, and that's what the Bible says. We need to chase in thy son while there's hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. And you know, a lot of people, a lot of parents, you, you never want to see, no parent wants to see their children cry. Right? It's not pleasant. It's not a fun experience. I don't like, I mean, my daughter was just crying this morning because of something with breakfast. But it's like, you don't like them being sad. You don't like them being upset. And when you appropriately discipline them, guess what they're going to do? They're going to cry. But the Bible's saying, don't let that cause you not to do the proper discipline. He's saying, let not thy soul spare, so don't lack, don't hold back because they're crying. It's something that needs to be done. It's necessary. And you need to keep that in your mind so that you don't just, just, just lack or let your soul spare for his crying. You're in Proverbs 13. Look at verse 24. Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And that word betimes, again, it's another old word that, that means early. That's all it means. You need to chasten them early. If you love your child, you're going to chasten them early. You're going to chasten them when they're young. And it says, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now, it's no mistake that it's using that word rod. And I've heard this. People try to make explanations and excuses for the word of God, for what it says, and try to say, oh, well, this is just metaphorically, you know, it's a metaphorical rod. Well, well where did the metaphor even come from? Right? If you're saying it's metaphorical, the rod is used for disciplining. And, that, and, and that's the truth. And we're going to see that in a minute. But people will try to explain away these verses out of Proverbs, out of, the book, out of the Word of God, and say, well, all that means is you just need to discipline them in some way. And they try to make justifications because you know, the big thing these days, I think, at least if it still is, is like the timeouts, you know, no physical punishment whatsoever. It's just... You know, take things away from them or, or make them sit in a corner by themselves for 30 minutes or however long and just, and just sit there. And I'll tell you what, that is not biblical disciplining. It's not. It's a, you could try to explain away this verse all you want, but turn if you would to Proverbs 23 because there is no explaining away Proverbs 23. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a, a lame, futile attempt uh, I've ever heard for people trying to explain what the words say in Proverbs 23. But what we just saw in Proverbs 13, it says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now think about that. How many parents would like to think that you hate your children? No one would say that you hate your children. If you spare your rod, you hate them. That's according to the Bible. According to God's word, if you are not disciplining your child, if you spare the rod, for whatever reason. Now that reason may be laziness. 
That reason may be, I don't want to hear their crying. That reason may be, whatever. According to the Bible, it says you hate your son. And you don't get mad at me. I didn't write this book. I'm just, I'm just reading it. I'm preaching out of it. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Apply thine heart unto instruction, and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. And he's going to define what correction is. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Look at verse 4. You know those, those commandments, the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Look at verse number 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. That's what the book says. This is the book of wisdom. This is, this is, you know, if you want to raise your children in a godly way, in a way that the Bible, the Bible has the answers for everything, my friends. Show me somewhere else in the Bible that tells you to, to, to not spank your children, to not discipline them with the rod. Because I have very clear verses that says, thou shalt beat him with the rod. And I don't care if that's politically correct today. I don't care if the government's going to threaten to come and take my children away. I am going to follow God's word exactly the way it says. And yes, I spank my children when they act up. Yes, I do. And I'm not afraid about it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to cover up for it because it's not politically correct today. I am going to follow God's word because I love God's word. And this is the right way to do it. And the Bible says, if that, you know, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Why does it say that? Children need to understand that there is a painful consequence for disobedience. When we sin against God, I mean, it's nice to just live in this fantasy land where there are no consequences for our actions. And, oh, well, if I, if I do something wrong, if I sin against my parents, I'll just sit somewhere for a little while. Well, I got to tell you what, that's not the way the real world works. That's not the way God works. When you sin against God, the punishment is hell. And that is torture. And that, that is way worse than any redness on the rear end is going to experience. The redness of the flames of, of, of hell are way more serious than that. And kids need to learn from a young age that when you break the, the laws, when you break God's rules, when you break your parents, when you're not reverent, when you're disobedient, there is going to be a punishment and it's not going to feel good. And that will change their behavior. I mean, anyone who knows my children, we go out all the time and I'm not, please don't take this the wrong way because I don't want to like, you know, exalt myself or lift us up. But when we go out, the children know how to behave. It's not by accident. People will compliment us and say, oh, wow, your kids, you know, they're sitting so well. Yeah, you better bet they are. Because we're training them, we're teaching them. Now, it's not all just beating all the time. Obviously, you need to, to spend time teaching and loving and, and doing other things with them. Of course, it's a whole package. But when you start taking elements away, I mean, the Bible says this is a very serious one on how you correct your children, how you discipline them. Look, we're talking about delivering their soul from hell. They need to understand these concepts so that they don't just think that now, because people these days want to just say they focus only on God's love, which God's love is tremendous and it's enormous and, and His mercy and His long-suffering and His forgiveness, all excellent things. But we can't take away God's wrath. We can't take away God's anger. He has both. And that's why so many people these days, you know, I talk to people, they don't even believe hell's real. They think, well, this is hell. Or, or yeah, you know, I may believe heaven's real, but I don't believe hell's real. Why is that? This is part of the reason. Because they, 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 they live in a world of, of timeouts. They think, well, if I'm bad with God, I, you know, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll just spend more time here. Or I'll just be asleep in the ground or something like that. You know, but, but that, that concept of hell is just too, too much for people to handle. But it's the truth. It's the truth. It's, it's what God's word says. But we, so think about that now. We're going to apply this because this is how a father, this is how a mother, how a parent ought to be disciplining their children. Now the Bible says that if you're born again, in John 1, 12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. When you put your faith on Jesus Christ, you are born again. You have a new spirit that's born inside of you. You have become God's child. There's false doctrines out there that like the people say, everybody is a child of God. That's not true. Why does John 1, 12 say that certain people have the power to become a son of God? 
We don't all start off that way. We become a son of God when we put our faith in Christ, when that spirit is born again. Because this flesh isn't born of God. We have a sinful flesh, and this flesh is going to pass away. It's that spirit that's born again that, is, that is, comes from the seed, which is the word of God. It's that, that spirit is born of this seed of God's word. And when it's born, um, it's a new creature. It's a new life. And we become God's children. And that's when we know, hey, if now I'm a son of God, he's going to deal with me as a son. And God doesn't do timeouts. So when the chastening comes, it's, it's going to be legitimate. It's going to be serious. But it's because God loves you. It's because he's trying to get your attention. He wants to correct whatever you're doing that's wrong. He wants you on the right path. All of God's laws, all of God's rules, look at every single one of them. None of them are just arbitrary. None of them are just, well, I just want the rule to be like this because I said so. Every single law and commandment of God is for our benefit. And I can prove that to you. If you have anything that you think, oh no, but what about this one? Yes, there's a benefit for that. And I can prove it to you. Every single one is for our own good. He doesn't do things, you know, people like say, oh, that God, he's no fun. You know, I can't go out drinking and smoking and partying and, and, and fornicating and doing all these other things. Look, none of that's going to bring you happiness. None of it will. It's just going to bring you misery and, and sadness. And the end of that stuff is, is death and destruction. God, no, God made us. God literally formed us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what's good for us. He knows what we need, which is why he made these commandments and these rules the same way that I know what's best for my children more than they do. Imagine if I left it up to them, eat whatever you want. Go to bed whenever you want, right? Uh, you don't have to learn anything. To, you know, just learn whenever you want to do it. Learn, just anything you want to do, just you have free reign. How are they going to turn out? It does, it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, you, you, it, it doesn't take a scientist to, to figure this stuff out. They need the, the structure. They need the discipline. They need somebody to be, be helping them along and telling them, you need to be doing this now. You need to be doing this. And as they grow, they could do it on their own. Well, God has given us his instructions, instructions and in righteousness, how we ought to be living and behaving because he knows us. He knows infinitely more than we do with our feeble human minds. He knows way more. But um, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12. Because the Bible says in verse number 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So, first of all, I just want to say, that word bastard, I don't, you know, again, I don't care what the world says. If the world says this is a cuss word or anything like that. The Bible says that every word of God is pure. Every word of God is true. I don't censor the Bible and say, oh, this is a dirty word. Because it's not. Hell is not a dirty word. Bastard is not a dirty word. It has a legitimate meaning. It means it's a, it's a, it's a child born out of wedlock. A child born with, with no you know, father as a husband around to raise that child. That's what a bastard is and that's what the Bible says. He's saying, look, if, you don't have to, if you're not being disciplined, it's because there's no father around. What he's saying is, if, if you're without chastisement, if you're not being disciplined, you don't have a heavenly father. You're not saved. And this is why we can see this today in our culture. You can look at people and, and you often wonder and be like, why is it that some of the most godless people, the people who live these lives of you know, wickedness, before you think of like some of the movie stars and the rock stars and stuff, and they have it all. Like, why isn't God judging that person? They have all these riches and all this stuff. Well, they're not being disciplined for one because they're not God's child. And they will receive a punishment later. And see, that's a key difference. You reap what you sow, but some people, they may not ever get that full um, punishment until after they die. So you might look at someone and be like, man, this person, they, they were wicked. They never loved, they hated God. They did all these things. They lived until they were 80 years old. And I, they never seemed to have any problems. Well, guess what? They're going to have problems for the rest of eternity. And don't ever let that cloud your mind of thinking that, you know, oh, well, maybe I should just do some of these things then too because it doesn't seem to matter. No, if you're a child of God, you will get disciplined. He's saying that 
There is no son whom the father receives that's not going to get chastised, not going to get scourged. Okay, and this is what the Bible's teaching us. So you could always take comfort. Hey, if you're getting, if you get into sin and God's disciplining with you, you'd be like, well, at least I know I'm saved because, <laughs> because I've got a father that's, that's disciplining me, that loves me, that's taking care of me. And, and, and he was looking out for my, my well-being. So how does God chastise us? And um, uh, yeah, my notes were flipped over. You, if you want to turn, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to see a story here. Um, but again, keep, we're going to keep going back to Hebrews chapter 12 because that's our main verse. We're kind of going through these verses and there's different points with the chastising. So you say, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to get chastised by God, but how does he do it? Obviously, you know, he's not literally taking a rod and, and, and beating our behinds like we do with our children because that's not the way he operates. We're going to see one example of how God um, will deal with us when we commit sin, when we commit iniquity. And in 2 Samuel 7, this is when David wanted to build a temple. And he talks to Nathan and he's saying, look, you know, we live in these houses and God's just got this tent and I want to build a great temple unto God. So we asked Nathan, he's like, sure. He's like, do what's in your heart, you know, like anything you want to do. And um, then God explains, he's like, wait, you know, you are not going to build this temple, but your son will. And this is where we're at in 2 Samuel chapter 7, just to give you a little bit of context. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, verse number 12, the Bible says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, talking to David, I will set up thy seed after thee, talking about Solomon, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. So again, we see this father-son relationship that he has with Solomon. Solomon was saved, obviously. Then it says, If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. So he's saying, God will use other people. God will use other things and other events to happen in our life to, in order for us to get this chasing, in order for us to get disciplined. He used it oftentimes. He used it as a nation in, as a whole with the nation of Israel when, when he would send in the, the heathen lands and they would come and they would you know, attack them and take over and bring them into captivity and everything else. That was all judgment on his people. Because they didn't listen to him. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't hearkening unto his words. They weren't, they weren't hearing and obeying. And it's the same way, you know, if, if my children were just to say, I don't want to listen to you. I'm not going to do anything. That, I mean, one, that's disrespectful. And for two, that's going to be met with a punishment. And um, that's what God has dealt with the children of Israel time and time again. And also even individually, he's here, he's talking specifically about Solomon. Hey, if he commits iniquity, if he commits sin, I'm going to chase him. I'm going to discipline him with the rod of men. He's going to experience that. And Solomon got the, the kingdom rent, well, rent from his son. And he kind of screwed up a lot of things at the end of his life when he committed iniquity. But he ended up reaping what he sowed. And um, let's go back to, well, we're in, you're in 2 Samuel. Flip back to Deuteronomy 21. I'll read from you from Hebrews 12, verse 9. Hebrews 12, 9 says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall not we much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And oh, one more point I want to make on that, that last subject. So God chastens us as his children when basically when bad things happen. God could cause, like for example, God could cause me to, you know, get in a car wreck or lose my health or lose my job. Or, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that God can influence or impact my life. To, to punish me, to discipline me. That can be very serious. I mean, it could even come from a beating or, or whatever, whatever it may be. There's lots of ways that God can influence this. And this is a point, I want, I want to spend a little bit of time on this because people will mock and argue against people who believe, which we do, and once saved, always saved. We believe that once a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they're born again. 
They become God's son. They become God's child. And you are saved forever because God has promised that you have eternal life. And by definition, eternal means forever. You can't lose that. God doesn't take a gift away from you once he's given it to you. It's yours. It's eternal life. You have it forever. But people will mock and argue and say, oh, well, then that just means you could go out and do whatever you want and everything's just okay. And it's just fine. And I always have to say, no, it's not just fine. It's not just okay. Now, Jesus Christ still died for all of my sins. Yes, and I still will go to heaven when I die. But it doesn't just mean it's just okay to just sin. I mean, it's just like my daughter. If she just went out and did whatever she wanted, does that somehow make her no longer my daughter? Of course not. But does that mean I'm just okay with it and it's just fine? No, no absolutely not. She is going to get disciplined. She is going to get chastised. And that's where the chastisement of the Lord comes in with us. And this is very important to understand, especially the people who, who, who argue against the once saved, always saved, because it's not just okay, and that's not what we teach or believe. But we do believe that Christ paid for all sins of all time forever, and that eternal life is a gift that's freely given to us that we have to receive one time. As John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. You're not going to get it later. It says you have it. You have everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It's something that happens one time. You were headed towards death. You were headed towards hell. The moment you became a sinner and the moment you put your faith on Christ, all of your sins are pardoned eternally speaking in God's eyes from that punishment of hell because you've accepted what Jesus has done for you. But that doesn't mean, just like in Romans 6, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course we shouldn't do that. We're his children. We, want, we need to be good children. We ought to be good children. But once you're born, you're his son. You can't be unborn. And, and I just wanted to, to point that out and clear that up because people will have these arguments against it. And, and a lot of people, they don't want to receive the free gift because... They just, they want to feel like they're doing their part in earning their way to heaven. And you can't earn it. No matter what, it can't be earned. It has to be received freely. But um, you're in Deuteronomy 21, correct? Mm -hmm. I'll re I'm going to reread from you Hebrews 12.9 because this is where I'm going to reinforce Hebrews 12.9. Uh, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. You respect your parents when they chasten you, when they discipline you, when they correct you. It comes naturally. That's what happens. He says, Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And I want to focus in on that last phrase where it says, and live. Because this is important. And this, this is also key to understanding our chastening and how far God can potentially go with that and hopefully to help you understand a, a verse that people will ridicule as well in the Old Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, verse number 18. This is God's given, you know, the, the second giving of God's laws and how um, we ought to deal with a stubborn or rebellious child. Look what it says in verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. So they're stubborn, they're rebellious, they're disciplining him, they're chastening him not listening, just really stiff neck, just not listening at all. Verse number 19, Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, so literally physically take him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And just so you understand, they, they put these in here, a glutton and a drunkard. We're not talking about a five-year-old, <laughs> okay? We're not talking about a little child. Because people, again, they, they mock and ridicule God's word because it was, oh, well, if you just have a, a, a disobedient child, are you going to put him to death? It's not talking about a five-year-old. This is talking about someone who's obviously grown enough to be a glutton and a drunkard, but they're still, you know, under the authority of their parents and they're just completely rebellious. 
They're not, you know, they're not listening. They refuse to obey. And look at the punishment. Verse 21. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. And I don't make excuses for God's word. It's what it says. That is a righteous judgment according to God's law. It may be a difficult one to swallow, but it's what it says. And that's, that's the way that he designed it. And he said, look, as a parent, I could understand completely not wanting to see your child put to death. But that's why the early chastening is so important. You discipline them properly when they're young, you will never get to this point, ever. And that's, that's good news. But this is the way God has ordained for this to be dealt with. Now, this is the law that he's given. I mean, it's a, you know, and I, we were talking about this yesterday too. It's not our place to just go and start rewriting all the laws that we have today and just um, and start implementing God's laws from the Old Testament, even though the, they're not our laws of the land today. He's giving them the laws of the land in Israel um, for the time of the judges and everything else. And, and I believe that these are still legitimate and um, righteous laws to have. But you don't take the laws into your own hand and just start doing them. Just like the Bible says that, that sodomite should be stoned. That if a man lieth with a mankind, as he lieth with a woman, they too shall be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. That's a righteous law. Now, is that the law of our land today? No, it's not. So should we just go and take up arms and just start, start executing people because it's God's law? No. But does that mean that God's law is not righteous? No, it is. And that's... that's the, that's what he said. And this is what he said ought to be done with rebellious children. Now, keep that in mind because he said in Hebrews 12, 9, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Be careful with your attitude towards God's laws and his commandments. And when he chastens you, we ought to listen to that. We ought not to despise the chastening of the Lord so much that God feels like all he has left to do now is to punish us by taking our life away. And there is there's examples in the Bible. I'm thinking about one. Now, we don't know enough about Ananias and Sapphira, but remember in the book of Acts when um, you know the church was getting started and everything's growing and people were like selling things. They were bringing all this money into the church and um, Ananias and Sapphira, they, they sold a property and they brought the money and laid it down at the disciples' feet, but they, they kept part of it back for themselves. But they lied and they were saying like, yeah, we sold it for all this. You know, here you go. This is, we sold it all and we're giving it to you. And they fell down dead. Now, we don't know what else was going on in their life prior to this. Okay, we, we don't have that background knowledge of these people. But it's a possibility that they had not been obedient to God's words because God decided, at least for them, a punishment that he de determined was just for them was for them to lose their lives. Now, I think that they were saved, but their punishment was that they, were, they were lost their life here. And um, that is a punishment because here is where we have the opportunity to, to build our inheritance in heaven, so to speak, by by winning souls by doing the things that God has for us that we could earn rewards and we can earn these things for ourselves to, to have where moth and rust don't corrupt and where thieves don't break through and steal. As the Bible says that we can have these treasures and these rewards built up for us in heaven and we earn those things while we're on this earth. You don't earn them once you're in heaven. You earn them here and now. And um, by losing your own life even, that's, that cuts short your opportunity to do that. And, um, and that is a punishment. But regardless of them, their specific situation, it was a judgment that God thought was worthy of death. And if we decide to just not hearken and not listen, I believe that he can do the same exact thing for us. He says, okay, you're just being disobedient and rebellious and stubborn. And I've chastened you. I've disciplined you. And you're still not listening. That's it. But... Thank God, if you're a son, you're still a son. You're still a daughter. You're, you're, you're not unborn. But you still have to, to face that consequence of just losing your life here. And um, so let's keep going here through Hebrews. We're almost done. Hebrews 12. Um, and go ahead and go back to Hebrews 12. 
verse number 10, says, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Again, he's doing it for our profit, for our benefit, that we could be partakers of his holiness, of being set apart and, excuse me, living righteously the way that he has um, ordained for us to live. And I'll read from you from Psalm uh, 94, 12. says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. So, Psalm's saying, look, uh, whoever is chastened of the Lord, if you're disciplined by God, you're blessed. That's a good thing because um, God's teaching you and it also says that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity. When you're doing what's right, when you get disciplined for doing things wrong now, you could straighten up your act so that it'll, it'll help you in the future by not getting into more problems. And um, overall, it's a benefit for you. Look at verse number 11 of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Now, the purpose of all this chastening, again, it's to bring us to this peaceable fruit of righteousness. It's for our benefit. It's for our own good. So when you might be going through these problems, Abigail, sit up. When you might be going through problems in your life, for one, you can take comfort in the fact that whatever you're going through, it's not as bad as what Jesus went through. It's probably not as bad as what Job went through. You know, Job lost his tel ten children and everything that he owned, basically, and then he was struck with boils all over his flesh. I mean, just completely miserable to where everything was taken away. But, um, and that wasn't his own fault. That wasn't as a result of his own sin. He was not being chastised or disciplined for something he did wrong. That was just an attack of Satan. But... We can keep this in remembrance, but if you're being chastened and you know it, and you say, you know what, I've sinned, I know I've done wrong, take comfort in the fact that God loves you, which is why he's disciplining you, but also take comfort in the fact that when it's over, when, when you're done receiving your disciplining, it's going to yield, it's going to produce that peaceable fruit of righteousness. As long, I mean, if you hearken to it, because when you do what's right, you truly do have that peace, that peaceful fruit. When you could lay down at night and you put your head down on your bed and you know, I mean, everything that I've done today, like, like I have a clear conscience. I didn't do anything that, that would violate God's law. I mean, that is a peaceful, great feeling as opposed to, I'm sure everyone here could has understand at least at one point in their life has done something where you just feel horrible because you've, you've done something, you've done wrong. And you know you've done wrong and, and you know it causes you to lose your sleep and to be stressful and things like that when you're doing what's right and you have a clear conscience that is perfect peace and when we're doing right by God we have that peaceable fruit of righteousness and sometimes you need to be disciplined to help get your act together and straighten up with God but it's gonna produce good fruit and you ought to be um, not despising that chastening but listening to it and hearkening to it um, turn, if you would, to um, 1 Corinthians 11. I'll read for you just from Deuteronomy 8. Turn to 1 Corinthians 11. That's the last place I'll have you turn. Uh, we're almost done. For Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1 reads, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your father. See, all good things. When God commands his laws, he says, look, if you do these things, you'll live, you'll multiply, you'll possess the good land. You have all these great blessings. Verse number two, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. 
Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, so because of this, because we know that God will discipline us, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. We need that healthy fear of the Lord. This is where the fear of God comes in. Now, the Bible tells us not to fear anything in this world but him, but God. That is the only fear that we ought to have. That's the only righteous fear. Anything, anything else, like we shouldn't fear other men. We shouldn't fear government. We shouldn't fear anything else. Fear not what man can do unto you, the Bible says. The only fear we should have is the fear of God. God has the power to protect us, and God also can discipline us and punish us. Um, again, as, as a father with a child, the same way my parents, or my parents, my children ought to, to fear me. Now, does that mean they don't love me and, and can be comfortable with me and everything else? No, of course. They, they're very comfortable with me. I mean, watch them. They talk to me and, and, and everything else, but they'll have respect and they'll, they'll, they do have a fear that if they do wrong, they're going to get disciplined. And that's the same way we can be with God. We can have a great relationship with God. We can go to God with all of our problems. We can talk to Him freely, show respect, and just have that proper fear that we know, hey, He has these rules, and if I'm going to break them, He's going to discipline me. He's going to punish me. And that will help us to, to, to keep walking in that right path. So 1 Corinthians 11, how do we just avoid being chastened? Because nobody likes being chastened. No one wants to be disciplined. No one wants to be punished. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 31 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, we need to judge ourselves. Okay, I'm not going to judge you today. You need to do that to yourself. I don't know all of the details of your life. I don't want to know all of the details of your life. You know what's going on in your own life, okay? And as you read the Bible more, as you hear more scriptural teaching, as you learn more about what's right and what's wrong, apply it to yourself. You have to apply it to yourself. No one can make you get right with God. No one, you know, I'm going to do my best to try to teach you the laws and the commandments and all the things that we should be following and adhering to so that you could know them and it could be proved to you and be like, yeah, I see that. So that you can make the changes necessary in your own life so that you can avoid the chastening and the disciplining. Because I'll tell you what, whether you know or not, if you're sinning, God's still going to discipline you. He'll still punish you. You say, well, I didn't know that. Well, it was here. It's available for you to know. It's not, like, it's not like you had no opportunity to learn. It's in his words. He's given it to us. So he's putting that burden on you to make sure that you know what he's saying to you. It's your responsibility. And um, he will hold you responsible for that. So um, my, last, my last point is just remember that if you're being chastened by God, Revelation 3.19, um, the Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And this is, you know, our church sometimes, people may not like it, like, oh, you know, you guys preach on sin a lot, and, and it's real hard, and everything else, and, and I don't always feel good when I leave there, or whatever. It's, it's for your benefit, honestly. It's not because I hate you. It's not because, you know, oh, I saw, I saw you smoking out on the street before you came in. Look, that's not it. I preach what this word says because we all need to know. We all need to understand it. And we're all going to be better off in our own personal lives the closer we can adhere to God's laws. And it's, and it's, now look, free grace. I believe it 100%. Your salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that the law is just null and void as far as God expecting you to obey it. It's, it still has, serves a purpose. Okay? And He still wants us to follow a certain way. It's not going to bring us our salvation, of course. It's a free, the free salvation is a free gift, but it's still there for us to be obedient children. Same way my children are always my children, regardless of my rules, but the rules still stand, and I still expect them to follow them as my children, to be good children. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for loving us, and loving us enough to, to actually deal with us properly 
and to, to get our attention and to make sure that we're not gonna, gonna keep going down the, the wrong path that we may start leading down, dear Lord, but that you love us enough to correct us appropriately. God, help us, those of us who are parents, to, to discipline our children appropriately the way that the Bible says and not to spare for the crying, but to know that it's the right way, it's the good way, it's the way that you've ordained for us to, to raise them. And um, help us not to just be caught up in the philosophies of this world, but just to stay true to your words, dear Lord. And um, help us to understand more about your instructions, about your laws, so that we wouldn't ignorantly be, be sinning against you, dear God, but that we would be able to, um, to just follow as closely as possible. And we love you. We thank you so much for your tender mercies. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.